Father God, as we come into your presence and you enter our hearts, may they be lifted up to you in praise and song, in melody and music. Bless our offering to you, that it may be pleasing in your sight. For you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Good morning, all. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad in it. Welcome to all who are attending in person, live streaming, or watching at at a later time. Mark your calendars for a number of things going forward in the next couple of months. 
Uh, this week is our week for manning dinner at the Bell. July 30th, there will be a work party here at 9 o'clock. Men's breakfast continues on August 13th at 8.30 in Stalker Hall. And the um, church picnic will be held with after services August 28th, more details in the bulletin and to come. Today, we'll have a hybrid Sunday school on the Dead Sea Scrolls continuing at 11.30 uh, in Calvin Lounge and online. Please pray for those on the prayer and concerns list. Next week, uh, John Reeder will be in the pulpit and leading Sunday school. And uh, now, uh, Pastor Bob Nicholson will provide an introduction to today's services. In our worship, we bring ourselves to God as we come into his presence. God awaits our arrival. We are not spectators. We are actors. The very word liturgy in English is worship. And I'm told, don't turn my back on the microphone. The word worship is liturgy, and liturgy literally means the work of the people. It's two Greek words. Write this down. Laos, from which we get the word laity, and ergos, from which we get the word work, ergonomics, laity at work. One of the most alarming, distracting things I learned just recently was what we call the places you sit. What do you call that? How do you spell that? So I drilled down. The word pew comes from a Middle English word, P-E-W-E, P-E-W-E, which means balcony. Does this come out? Sorry, yeah. Can I do this? Can you still hear me? Balcony. Pew. Worship is not a spectator sport. We do not have a balcony religion where we look down on the crowded ways of life, removed, disenchanted, saying our prayers and saying our hymns that has no connection with life. In churches that I've served, since the pews are not balconies, we have renamed them workstations. You're sitting at a workstation. And in the churches that I've served, those pew racks, those workstation racks, have been expanded. And they have included three by five cards, envelopes, pens, in addition to Bibles and hymn books. So you can write a prayer request, you can write a note to the session, why don't you? You can write a note to the pastor, be sure and remember Sally, he went to the hospital yesterday. And there will be in that copies of a folder like this that you've produced. You should be very proud of this church. This is a six-fold, I mean, yeah, six-fold folder that you produced that should be in every pew because you need to take one and remember somebody that's not here and invite them and give this to them. That's why a workstation is important. 
Today you were invited to work, to sing, to pray, to remember, to pay attention, and to continue to ask questions. What's going on here? Why did he say that? Why did he do that? So let's get to work and discover what work God has for us to do as we pray your kingdom come, your will and work be done now here on earth. Amen. And now we continue with call to worship. Please participate responsively. Listen up now. Praise God. Bring a gift of music and song. Sing, your, sing yourselves into God's presence. Know, know that God is... Enter with the password. Thank you. Make yourselves a home, talking and singing praise. Thank him. Worship him. God is your beauty, all generations in love, loyal always and ever. We're going to start again. Meet to offer praise and prayer. May we find in fuller measure what it is in Christ we share. Here as in the world around us, all our varied skills and arts, with the rising of the Spirit, into open minds and hearts.
Dear Lord and Father of humankind, forgive our foolish ways, reclothe us in, the, in our rightful mind, in pure lives thy service finds, in deeper service prays. Breathe through the hearts of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire, speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of calm. In simple trust, like theirs who heard, beside the Syrian sea, the gracious calling of the Lord let us be. Like them, without a word, rise up and follow thee. Take from our souls the strain and stress. Let our ordered lives confess the glory of your name. May your love come to us, your power embolden us, and your grace forgive and lead us to be the new creation in Christ that you have promised, amen. provided for me more unexpected, new, delightful, amazing, I don't understand it, experiences than I've had in a long time. I'm going to ask my scouting buddies to come up now, stand by the piano, and we're going to do something that's not in the bulletin. It's my turn to surprise you. Ready? You don't sound ready. You're ready. Have you ever had the experience when you're on a path 
to do some specific things, some specific tasks, to get to some specific designations, and something comes up. A new vista breaks into your life and your vision. Yesterday, at 4.47 p.m., I'm just getting ready to settle down, have a cool one, and watch the Seattle Sounders play the Chicago Fire at Soldier's Field. And then it came to me. I was at Soldier's Field for the Festival of Faith of the Second Assembly of the World Council of Churches in 1954 as I worked as a full-time volunteer on the youth department staff for a year of the National Council of Churches in Chicago between my college and seminary work. It was a moment of spiritual awareness. Then, I got a box. Hand me the box. Yeah. I got a box. Several of you have seen a box like this, right? From the Valley of the Kashmir. And I got to thinking, I've been through Kashmir on the Empire Builder twice a month for three months for three years. We go right by one of the warehouses. I've enjoyed what's in the box. But then I wondered, those treats come out of the Liberty Orchard. Why is it called the Liberty Orchard? It's because two brothers fled in 1915 the genocide of the Armenian people where the Turks rooted them out of their home, put them on a first forced march to the desert with no food and water. And they migrated to this company and they, company and they settled in 1920 and started the Liberty Orchard. And then I went to a fresh fruit market, fresh fruit and vegetable market. Now my scouting, my scouting associates will unveil and fold carefully the sacred cloth, <laughs> which are restaurant napkins. And there you will see, stand by, that step back, don't get too close. <laughs> get your hand off that plum. You've got to watch him all the time. Um, and you know what came over me? In the fresh fruit and vegetable market, the wonderful hymn that's in your book, For the Fruit of All Creation. Plowing, planting, silently growing. And then, as if that wasn't enough, the soccer game has now started. I'm already caught up in another world. So I open the church bulletin and I read every word. 
and I saw the prelude and postlude that Gary has played and will play. They were created by Gary's friend and mine, Benny Hamill. Benny Hamill was a nationally acclaimed concert organist and God in his wisdom knew I was in desperate need of musical help. And Benny came and said, Bob, you have a new three manual Rogers organ. I don't have one in my apartment. Could I use your organ to practice? Here's the key to the church. And so from time to time, he would stand in for our regular organist. And then Betty and I had the idea, one night, <clears throat> at midnight, a neighbor, we're in a neighborhood, blocked off the streets so there wouldn't be any noise. And I had a cassette recorder. And he sat and for an hour and a half sat at the console of that Rogers 890 Westminster organ. And he played familiar hymn after familiar hymn with no music on the organ. He created that night the music that Gary has played for the prelude and he created the music Gary will play for the postlude. And I didn't know until just before services that in my wisdom I had invited Gary to be there. And my wife had prepared hors d'oeuvres and some refreshments. But in that Lake City Presbyterian Church setting at midnight, a concert at midnight, the music was written that Gary is playing. Do you know what that does for my heart? I can't describe it. So I get distracted. I lose my place. I forget my bulletin. I look at the wrong hymn. You wonder, is he lost again? I was lost in wonder, love, and praise. And I thank God, and I thank my scouting friends who are going to be back to help with the second act with the farmer's market. Thank you. Now we turn to the prayers of the people and I want to make my confession first. These prayers that I'm going to pray are in the hands of the priest and the deacon, Father Joseph and Deacon Duane at Our Lady of Hope Catholic Church nearby. And I did that because what we're going to pray, the Lord's Prayer today, is the prayer just like they're going to pray it. And the prayer we're going to pray today is just like the New Testament reading last week, if you paid attention, from today's English version, where we pointed out that thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory is not in the prayer that Jesus taught in Matthew and Luke's gospel. It was added by the early church later when they looked back to David who praised God for thine is the kingdom, thine the glory, thine the power at the dedication of the temple. So we're going to pray it like they pray it, which, by the way, is more biblical than Presbyterian. That ought to tighten John Calvin's knickers. So let us pray. O oh God, to whom we come in silence and sincerity, our presence today is our prayer. Our words fall short and fail us but your love never fails us. 
Thanks be to you for the gift of life, love, leadership, service, sacrifice that Jesus modeled for us as he came among us as both servant and pioneer of our faith. Enable us to learn, to listen, to remember, to pay attention, and to ask questions. Let us today recommit ourselves to this way, his servanthood, his unconditional love, and the hope he brought and the hope he brings to us. Thanks be to you, O God, for this congregation of your people, for their worship, their service, their outreach, and their care. The music that melodies this sanctuary, the service of elders and deacons, and your continued call to study, serve, pray. May we be diligent, attentive, and responsive. Help us all to remember, to pay attention, and to ask questions. For those today who have challenges of health, isolation, homelessness, depression, send them your love and our love. We name them now silently in our heart. Now, as our Savior taught us to ask for forgiveness of our sins and to save us from the time of trial, we pray together with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters nearby at Our Lady of Hope. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord, listen to your children pray.
Uh, there's a warning label on this sermon. Not suited except for mature audiences. I need you to hang with me, not hang me, for about 12 minutes. Some words that will be in the sermon will be unsettling to you. They were spoken to me by a ruling elder in my congregation. They were not unsettling to me, I welcomed them. I can guarantee that the three scriptures in the sermon are unsettling. We're taking them out of the place of the reading of scripture and they're going to be in the body of the sermon. I haven't forgotten. In my ministry, in my preaching over years, I have resisted, I have avoided pious phrases and biblical cliches, though I haven't always been successful. The one time that I especially was not successful was in Lubbock, Texas, in a big downtown church like this tall steeple on the radio across from the courthouse. Standing at the door as the people went out and this wonderful, gifted ruling elder, civil engineer, good neighbor, said to me, quote, Pastor, you must have had a hard week because you didn't say a damn thing in your sermon. I welcomed that, and he was the kind of person that we then went to lunch and talked about it. You must realize that people are leaving the church. Critics of the church are thriving. Skeptics of the church are rejoicing. And our empty phrases and our pious talk. One critic said to me face to face, your actions and your inactions speak louder than anything you say. I want you to turn now with me to the prayer we all say. We all know it by heart. We can repeat it by rote without thinking. I have pondered it and prayed it. We have sung it and said it. I have researched and reflected. I've outlined it. I've studied its tenses, past, present, and future. Our needs, what God comes to meet our needs as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I've come to one conclusion. If we are not stopped, if we are not grasped, if we are not confronted by the opening phrase of the prayer, the rest can be just saying words. Forgive me if I offend anyone because this is a dear prayer. Deepen your hearts, deepen your experience. However, these words are based on three scripture readings that I'm going to quote and fully engaged. Your understanding may be different than mine, and I respect that, and I want to learn from you. I need to <clears throat> insert, just like I inserted the farmer's market, <laughs> Don't you love inserts? I need to insert that which I almost forgot. Remember Columbo with his disheveled raincoat and his old sob? He's getting ready to go out the door and he turns and says, oh, one more thing. This is one more thing. 
you need to remember two dates. One is 1962 to 65, and the other is 1985. The first was Vatican Council II, called by our dear friend Pope John XXIII. They created the International English Language Liturgical Consultation. And they did that because their worship was moving from all Latin to the language of the people. What a novel thought that it's in English, Spanish, Hebrew, Portuguese, Swahili. The second was 1985 at Boston University. There, representatives of all English-speaking Protestant, Anglican, and Orthodox churches met and collaborated with the Roman Catholic consultation on English language liturgy. Did you catch that now? The Catholics are talking to the Protestants. I don't want to upset you. But they were doing it based on the B-I-B-L-E and the best biblical scholarship that was available to both. And in that consultation was the Methodist, Presbyterians, Episcopal, Reformed Church of America, United Church of Christ, Lutheran, American Baptist, Christian Church's Disciples. And they all agreed on what's on page 19 of your blue hymnal. A fresh, more accurate version of not only the Lord's Prayer, but the Apostles and Nicene Creed. Their work dealt with words like ghost. Let's upset the children and tell them we believe in ghosts. Words like hell, Jesus went to hell. You hear that in a bar, not in church. Or the word that we call trespasses or debts, trespasses on somebody's land, debts to Wells Fargo. The word in Greek is hermetia, missing the mark. Estrangement from one another, not doing what we knew we had to do, and not, and not, and un, what's the word? Doing what you had to do, but not, help me out here, not doing what we had to do and doing what we should have done. So go back to the prayer with me, and let's pretend we're back in 10th grade English class. I struggled. And the assignment today is to diagram the sentence using the Lord's Prayer as the text. What is the subject? What is the verb? What is the object? The subject is God, his kingdom, his work. The verb is be done, be accomplished, get on with it. And the object is you and me, the church. That work is to be done through you and me. My neighbor and friend, the Episcopal Bishop of California, the Dean of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, lived two blocks up the street from the Presbyterian Church where I was one of the pastors. He often visited and preached. He's crazier than I was. He talked to the organist and say, "Play that again. I don't like that rhythm." <laughs> or uh, it would, I mean, he just—he was full of it. But he wrote a great book to the point: doing the truth. Don't learn the truth. Don't profess the truth. Do the truth. You can get it from Amazon. Still in print. We can't be fully engaged in doing the truth in accomplishing God's will if we have distractions and if we are defeated 
by our failures. We've gone over that. Our past failings, our past resentments, our past being hung up on some problem, person, or situation. This sermon is about divine discontent, about disruption of our routines and ways of thinking and distracting patterns and practices that are not productive for God's will and work. Now, if you haven't paid attention up until now, here's the time to pay attention. Put away the grocery list. The living word is being addressed to you and me from God's written word. In fact, you've caused me to get carried away several times. I'm still carried away. I got so carried away that I printed the sermon out. And I gave a copy to Doreen. And I'm going to send her an electronic copy. And if you want a copy, you can email, call her, and she'll email it to you. And there are about some folks where I live at Aljoy on Thornton Creek near Northgate Station. Some call it a retirement community. I call it a launching pad to life. They got, we got into conversation and said they'd like a copy. So there's six copies here if any of you want one today. The first is God's purpose, God's work, and God's will. John 3.16. You've seen it at football games and baseball games the sign hanging down from the balcony, God so loved the world. What were those people thinking that hung that sign? What does it mean? Remember, pay attention and ask questions. What does John 3.16 mean in Bible terms? God so loved the world. What does the word world mean in Greek in that prayer? World is oikumene. We get the word ecumenical and we get the word economical. God loved the whole inhabited, the whole economy of life. that he sent Jesus to save it. And now we get to the word, what is it to save? The word save is sozo. Its basic meaning is to protect, keep alive, preserve life, deliver, heal, be made whole. And there's a whole other sermon on the church call and mission to create wholeness in our world. And if that's not enough, listen to Jesus' words to you that describes your identity. Remember last week we went into great things about ancestry and patriots and so on. Your identity is described by God in his word in John 6, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you that you might bear fruit, and it's fruit that will last, not just the fruit on the table. Bear fruit, fruit that will last. And if you don't think that's enough, Pay attention and ask questions. What about Paul putting before us God's claim and call? In 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was reconciling the world to himself and giving us the ministry of reconciliation. Every elder, every deacon, Every minister in the Presbyterian Church USA has this historic, 
10-page statement of faith that is devoted to what that passage means. Read it. Study it. Pray it. Appropriate it for yourself and for the mission of your church. That statement of faith begins with one astounding sentence. And when I go around and visit churches and visit ministers, I ask them, um, I'm coming undone. I ask them, uh, how do you understand and how do you apply this basic statement of faith that is our Presbyterian church statement of faith? And the statement is this, it's one sentence, but it's dynamite. It affects our worship, it affects our prayers, it affects preaching. The church, it says, is called upon in every age to proclaim in word and deed the needs as the time requires. And you ask, what words are you using? What deeds are you doing? What does this time require? And most pastors change the subject. So stop, pay attention, ask questions. God is reconciling the world to himself. In fact, I got so carried away, carried away again that I printed out my friend Joe Small, Dr. Joseph Small, is the director of the Office of Theology and Worship of the General Assembly. As this was written in 1967, it's all male language, so he wrote it as an inclusive language document. And I printed it out and I gave it to your library in Shirley, so you've got it there uh, in inclusive language. And it's, and it's online and it's in the sermon that you can request from Doreen or pick up one here. So in short, remember who you are in God's eyes. Pay attention to God's call. Be faithful to you, to who you are as Reformed Presbyterian Christians and ask questions about your life, your church, your heritage, what's going on in the world around you. How can you be more present, dare to ask, dare to imagine, and to God be glory in the church throughout the generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, we turn now to the closing hymn. You know the spiritual, I know the Lord has laid his hand on me. I felt that when I was in kind of a funk, a down a bad mood, and I wrote these words, just a closer walk with you, and then we're gonna wrap it up.
close. Uh, hang on. We're still planning the worship for today. I've got to check with my lay leader. <laughs> As we're back to Colombo again. Oh, there's one more thing. I have a gift for everyone present. The first is, you remember last week the sermon, and I told you about going to the black restaurant in the concrete block building with the oil tablecloths and that multiracial, multi-societal group of men who took their prayer seriously and acted? Well, I found there was another clergy person who in... uh, 1738, remember I told you I was hesitant about going. I really didn't want to go. Well, this guy was not only hesitant, he was unwilling to go to the prayer meeting. But he said, all right, I'll go. And he went down to an address on Aldersgate Street. This is in 1738. And the result of his experience in that time of prayer were seven principles to live by. I copied them in color, I framed them, and I put them on heavier paper for you. That's one gift. And on the other side, I copied, does anybody here have a do-it list? I've got a long one. And so I copied here 37 individual action items that I need to do. These sermons and these handouts are not me to you, it's God to me and you. I'm saying nothing to you that I'm not saying to myself. Anyway, put this down. And then I read Ephesians 3.14 that God, by his power, can do more than you could dare to ask or imagine. And then I read that. And then I read a passage that said, arise, it's your task, we're with you. Be strong and do it now. Anybody have trouble with procrastination? So my right-hand man during the post of the day is going to hand one of these to each of you, and then we have some that will hand it to the choir. But now let's get on to the choir. They are a handful. Right, Steve? A big handful. And so do, where's, here's the box. So I'm going to commission Lois. My, come over here, Lois. And Lois is going to, uh, remember I mentioned apples and cutlets and the cashmere? Well, here is a taste of the cashmere valley for each choir member. And I'm commissioning her. I'm blessing her. And she's going to present each of you with your own medal of honor. And it will go on like this so that you will know that God and the people and the pastors appreciate you. So... First person that gets this can open it, and then you go ahead and, and give these one to each person. Now to her older husband. Who said that? It's true. <laughs> We're back at the farmer's market, and for this part, I need Gary and Steve to step forward. Oh, that's right. And we're so glad he's back from Scotland and Ireland and well again. Um, so I got carried away at the, at the uh, farmer's market. And the farmer's market guy said, my God, he's beginning to sing for the fruit of all creation. They don't have a lot of people shopping and singing hymns. And so I wanted to have each of them know that their music at organ and with choir produces much fruit and helps all of us to be better disciples. And so there are two baskets there, and they are identical. And they've been put together by the handmade, uh, I think uh, Danielle did it. But I'm going to give each of them a basket. And what's in the basket? And the basket is a gift to Steve and a gift to Gary 
and it comes with the love and affection of a guest minister and a grateful congregation. Can I have a round of applause? Amen. Somebody, Steve didn't get his tomato and pepper. Uh, and here are extra sermons. And now it says, uh, what does it say? The benediction. And I want you to again remember, as Gary plays the postlude, that midnight concert with hors d'oeuvres in the sanctuary of Lake City Presbyterian Church when our friend, the late Benny Hamill, created this music. Now we time and turn now to go forth, go forth with God's blessing. And may God's love be yours. May God's power be yours. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.